as we do in our service, we want to give you the opportunity to pray for those who are on your mind and heart this morning, maybe family members, um, neighbors, co-workers, um, maybe even there's a need within your own heart, and I just want to give you an opportunity to pray to your Father in Heaven right now, lift that need up to God, knowing that He's there, that He listens, and that He will respond. Father, now bless your word, speak to us, guide us into truth. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen. Amen, thank you, be seated. Now that looks much better. (laughs) It's a whole different group. If you have your Bible, I want to invite you to turn to the New Testament letter of 2 Peter. Second Peter, if you don't, we'll have it up here on the screen for you. Today, in continuing with the series, we're going to deal with the question, didn't the Catholic Church put the Bible together? Now, this is not designed to be offensive to Catholics, not at all, but there is a question out there as to where the, where the Bible as we have it today originated Uh, How did it come together? How was it formed? And I'm going to seek to answer those questions for you today. Again, last week we kind of ended with the whole point of, hey, the Bible has been attacked, it's been maligned, uh, and yet the Bible is an anvil that has worn out many hammers. It has endured throughout generations and stands even today as the most read book in history and the number one bestseller each and every year. But nonetheless, the attacks are present. Let me read a few of them for you. The Bible is a product of man, not of God. The Bible did not fall magically from the clouds. Man created it as a historical record of tumultuous times, and it has evolved through countless translations, additions, and revisions. History has never had a definitive version of the book. Now that's from the book The Da Vinci Code that was popular a few years ago. Bill Maher, you guys know the political talk show guy, he says the the Bible starts out like Mad Libs. (laughs) And then Christopher Hitchens wrote a book called God is Not Great, How Religions Poison Everything. And in that book he attacks the Bible. One of the things that's true about Christians is that we often make statements of faith without really knowing the reason why we believe the things that we believe. Now, the great thing uh, about those confessions of faith are that we share them with conviction. But the point of this whole message series has been to try to inform the reasons why we believe the things that we believe. Again, stating that, yes, we have a faith, but it's not a blind faith. It's a faith that's rooted in evidence. It's a faith that has reason. And yet, ultimately, we place our faith in God, we place our faith in Christ to be our Savior, and we place our faith in this book as God's Word. But the big question is why? Well, let me throw out for you this morning, just kind of as a way of waking us up a little bit, a little quiz, okay? A little quiz. This quiz is entitled, Where Did the Bible Come From? And maybe you can just check A, B, C, or D. A... Jesus wrote it and left it with the apostles. B, the Pope chose some writings and collected them into one book. C, some tablets fell from the sky and landed on some dude's head about a million years ago. Or D, God spoke through men using their unique positions and personalities He guided them to record his message to mankind. Now, if you said D, you were right. But you would be amazed. I've seen surveys. I've seen polls that have been taken. 
You'd be amazed at how often people respond with A, B, and C. 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 20 and 21 says this, Above all, you must understand that no prophecy of Scripture came about by the prophet's own interpretation. For prophecy never had its origin in the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. Now this is very important. Peter is saying here something that's vitally important for us to understand, that the Bible did not originate with man. It was in God's heart and God's intention to give us his word and to provide for us a record of which we hold today that is reliable as his word. And so Peter is saying this. He's saying God moved by the power of the Holy Spirit in men to record and to write the things that he wanted them to write. It wasn't dictation as if there was this voice from heaven and it was coming, you know, the sound waves were coming to the ear and the guy and he was dictating what God was saying. Instead, like a leaf that is carried along a river or like the clouds that are blown by the wind, God moved in the hearts of men to record the words that would be ours for eternity the things that he wanted to reveal to men and women about who he was and about his plans in history and about his events and how he worked throughout history were recorded through the unique personalities and positions. I shared with you last week that the Bible has 40 different authors. Amazing. Different personalities. Different perspectives. Different positions. Some were rich, some were poor. God used all types of men, diverse men, to record what he wanted to record to you and me in the scripture. So the big question today is, okay, well, how did it all come together? How did it all evolve to the point that we have it right now? If it was written, as we know it was written, over a 1,600-year time span by 40 different authors, how did God superintend the process? How did he oversee the process where throughout the centuries what would be recorded and what would be collected eventually was what we have as God's word? And then at the end we're going to bring it around to, well, so what? What does that mean for us? Let me speak with you about the coalescing of Scripture. And I think that's really a great word. Coalesce means to kind of bring together naturally, kind of the evolution of things coming together. The coalesce of scripture it's three periods really of course we know that the old testament was already by the time the new testament come around the the old testament was already in its current form i mean the books that we have now are the books that were there when jesus was around and the disciples and so these books had already come together in their form in their fashion and there was really no debate about the old testament Now, the Catholic Church includes what might be called intertestimonial books, the Apocrypha. These were books that are outside the canon of the Old Testament, books that were really in addition to. And as more conservatives and as more people who are more particular with respect to what should be included in God's Word and what shouldn't, and particularly after Martin Luther and the Protestant Reformation, We don't include the Apocrypha in our Bible. Now, the whole argument there needs to be this. Whether you include it or not is not really the the question. Even Catholics don't believe that they are on the same uh, level as the Old Testament or the New Testament, but that they're extra, that they are in addition to what the canon of the Old Testament is and what the New Testament is. So, three periods that really illustrate how God brought these things together. When we talk about the coalescing of Scripture, we're talking about what's called in theology the canon of Scripture. Maybe you've heard that word before. The canon of Scripture. Literally, it means this. The rule, the norm, the standard, the measure. In other words, when we talk about the canon of Scripture, we're talking about what should be included in the Holy Bible and what shouldn't. Three periods. First period was this. Period of unofficial formation. In other words, what happened is that you had the writers of the New Testament. We read like Luke, for instance, the physician. He recorded these events as a way of giving a testimony to what Jesus did. The book of Acts, we understand it's 
a record of the history of the first century church, that baby church, that new church that was born. And then we have the epistles and letters of Paul and Peter and James. These were letters that were written to churches to teach them certain doctrine and to keep them pure in their faith. So we have the writing of the New Testament by those who were either eyewitnesses of Jesus or those who were granted authority as apostles by the eyewitnesses of Jesus, which is a big standard with which it was decided what should be included and what shouldn't be included. So we have the New Testament in the form that we have it today that began to coalesce together into a package of writings. And so it was the unofficial formation of what we now know as the New Testament. Well, how did it come about? Well, first of all, it came about through circulation of these letters among the churches that were born. And also the reading of these books, the readings of these letters in these first century churches. Next, we have early quotations from the Gospels. And they're referenced as scripture. And they're all listed there in your message outline of your program. I don't want to go through all the names of the people, but the early church leaders who referenced the portions of the New Testament that we have today as scripture and equated them as scripture. Why? Because they recorded what Jesus did, his ministry here on the earth, his birth, his earthly life, his ministry, his death, his resurrection. Those were the gospels. The book of Acts records the history of the first century church, and then the letters afterwards are letters to churches that were written to encourage and to protect. These letters, these books began to be formed together in a very natural evolution. And so there were quotations from early church fathers, and again, they're listed there in your program, as scripture also Many people in the first and second century recognized Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John as, quote-unquote, the four Gospels. They began to call them such. And they also cited the other epistles. And again, they're listed for you in your message outline. Now, what we're talking about is an unofficial list and an unofficial canon of the New Testament that began to be formed. Well, there's a second period, though, that happens. This is really the kind of the whole crux of the matter. Heresies begin to arise in the late first century and second century. Heresies begin to arise. And as would be the case with fallen men, cults, sects, different groups begin to arise that begin to compete against the pure scriptures and the lessons of the New Testament. They begin to rival and to teach ideas that are inconsistent with what was written in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, with what was written in Acts, with what was written in the letters by the apostles. And so heresies arise. The first one is from a guy named Marcion in 140 AD. That's listed there for you. This guy was very interesting. He hated Jews. And he actually hated the Old Testament and thought that the God of the Old Testament was different than the God of the New Testament. And so he wanted to rid what would be called scriptures, wanted to rid the scriptures of the Old Testament. Thought that the God of the Old Testament was an evil God. So he started his own branch of Christianity, and it started catching on. It was really the rise of the first cult. So what happened is, as he looked at the Old Testament, he said, listen, it's not worthy to be included. And he came up with a list of his own, his own canon that was actually heretical. As we know from the Scripture, we teach in the Scripture, the reason we have the Old Testament is that Jesus validated the Old Testament. And often the apostles, the writers of the Gospels, quoted the Old Testament and validated it as Scripture in and of itself. So Marcion came along and tried to rid the canon of the Old Testament. There's another guy named Montanus, 156 A.D. He began to teach a more strict, more legalistic approach to the Scripture, that those who sinned and those who fell could not be redeemed. It was very similar to the Judaizers who wanted to include the Jewish law 
such as circumcision, the dietary laws, all these kinds of things, with Christianity. But Montanus came along and said, listen, you can't be forgiven. And he taught a more strict form of church discipline, a harshness of the faith, said that remarriage was not possible and ended up perverting what we understand as the pure scripture. And then Gnosticism. Some of you may have heard about Gnosticism. It's taught about quite a bit. Gnosticism was actually around the late first century. It became dominant, though, or predominant, in the middle of the second century, 140 A.D. Gnosticism comes from the Greek word gnosis. Gnosis is a word that means knowledge. And what the Gnostics began to teach was very similar, in fact, to Judaism and the Pharisees. They began to teach that only a limited number of people were capable of attaining spiritual knowledge or spiritual gnosis that they were far more important than the average people, and that this knowledge would result from not just mere obedience to God's moral law, but it was more than that. It was all about learning. It was a spiritual ascendancy that they had. So Gnostics, because of that, they began to see the world as being more spiritual than material. In fact, they defined Jesus as not having a true humanity. They denied Jesus' humanity, that he was not human. He was only God, and when he walked this earth, he was more of a phantom, more of a ghost than he was a literal human being, more than he was God and man combined in one body. So Gnostics tend to deny the goodness of the material world and of the physical life, and so there was a spiritual ascension. The body and the physical world were evil in their minds, and they began to pervert what was purely taught in the Scripture. So... The unofficial formation of the New Testament, combined with the heresies that began to take place in the first and second century, brought about the need of the church, of those who were Christians in that day, to say, listen, we need to define, so we can protect the teaching of the scripture, we need to define what we would include as, quote unquote, scripture as God's word. So the third period is a very natural result of the first and the second one, and that is an official formation of the canon. It's not some conspiracy. There was not even some creation of the Bible, as some would teach. Well, some men got together and they created the Bible. That was not it at all. What we see as early as 170 A.D., the Muratorian canon which was named actually after the guy who discovered this, the Muratorian Canon, in 170 A.D. listed the books that we currently have as our Bible as that of Scripture. That's how early it began. In response to the heresies, in response to the the cults that were uprising, Christians got together and said, listen, we need to define what is and what is not. And it is true that there were many writings back in that day Many writings, those that uh, were very similar to the scripture but had problems and heresies that were inconsistent with what we have in our Bible, those begin to be labeled as such. And so the Muratorian Canon was listed and listed the books that we now have, the Synod of Hippo in 393 A.D. Now, it's interesting here because you have a couple of centuries time gap. What that teaches us is that what we know as a scripture was just accepted as scripture. That there was this understanding of what was and what wasn't. And they had these councils. The early church fathers begin to have these councils. Now remember, this is even before the first pope. Before the official first pope. The Synod of Hippo, the Council of Carthage. These were councils that came together to say, these are the books that are inspired as God's word as a way of protecting the early church. So let me kind of recap for you the formation of the canon, and then we're going to bring this all the way back around, I promise you. The formation of the canon. What were the motivating factors? Why do it in the first place? Why say these are the scriptures and these are not? Well, first of all, the need for the identification and preservation of the apostles' teaching. 
You can imagine the subtle perversions that would take place over time had there not been some clarification and identification of what was truly the apostles' teachings. Widespread circulation. This was another thing. These early scriptures were spread among the churches all throughout that part of the world. And therefore, there was a need to speak to the churches about what was truly scripture and what wasn't so that heresies couldn't develop. Third, the heresies, obviously. The purity of the faith. The need for us to understand with clarity what is the essentials of the faith. And that's what we have in our Bibles today. We have an understanding of what was essentially the Christian faith and we also understand by default what is not. Anything that rivals, anything that competes, anything that conflicts with this is certainly understood as being heretical in the impure faith. And the other thing is persecution. Persecution. There was a time period, certainly before that first emperor who was kind to Christians, Constantine. There was a time in the first, second, third centuries when Christians were put to death. And there was a need for them to protect what were known as the scriptures, as God's word, in order to encourage them. And so Christians hid these scriptures. They kept them close. They kept them tightly to their communities because of fear of being eradicated. Yes, there were people back then that would have loved to have, quote-unquote, burned the Bible, stopped the spreading of the scriptures because of the life-transforming message of it. So because of persecution, the early church said, we need to decide what is and what isn't. Well, what was the criterion? What was the criterion set forth? What, what were the uh, uh, signs and the characteristics of those books that would be included as compared to those books that wouldn't be? The first thing was this, apostolic origin. This is so important. Apostolic origin, meaning this. When scriptures would be examined for inclusion into the canon or not, and, and back then they didn't even have the word canon, but they began to say, this is what we need to understand as Scripture. They began to look at, was this actually written by one of the eyewitnesses to Jesus' ministry or by one of those who had been given authority as an apostle by the first eyewitnesses of Jesus? Very important. Because a lot of people came up and said, well, I have authority to write this. And there were different Gospels that were written at that time. The Gospel of Thomas, we read about, had all kinds of weird stories in it. And so... They came up and said, listen, these should be included in Scripture. Sorry. Wasn't written by an eyewitness of Jesus and wasn't written by an apostle who was granted that authority as we read in the book of Acts. Secondly, universal acceptance. In other words, they looked at the churches. What were the churches reading? What was generally accepted to be uh, consistent as God's word? Those that were very uh, inconsistent, those that were not uh, accepted universally were those that were looked at with skepticism. And eventually what happened is this coalescing began to contain what we understand as the 27 books of the New Testament. Liturgical use. Well, which books and which letters did the churches read? Those first churches, which ones did they read? Which ones did they acknowledge as Scripture? Which ones did they look to? Which ones did they worship around? Liturgical use. And then, lastly, obviously, is a consistent message. What you see in the books of the New Testament is a very consistent message. The essential message of who Christ is. Of what He did. Of why He died. And the fact of his resurrection. The coalescing of God's word. Now, what I want to say to you is that I believe that God superintended this whole process, that he oversaw it, that he allowed this coalescing to occur in a rather supernatural way. You think about it. You think about the room for error. You think about the problems that could result with respect to the scriptures. And yet, what we have today is by book, by letter, 
what was accepted immediately following Jesus' death and resurrection. Immediately following the writing of those letters. Remember last week we talked about how there's a gap of 25 years between the original writing, the earliest copy that we have of the, of the Bible's manuscript, the New Testament. And we have thousands of consistent copies. That should give us confidence when we come to understand God's word. And when a Bill Maher makes a comment about the mixed up process of the Bible's formation or a Christopher Hitchens blast the Bible, we as Christians should stand with confidence to understand that, no, what we have is God working through men to lead us to understand what his word is and what we have today is consistent with what was taking place then. And though over time there was a need for a formal recognition, listen, it was recognition, it was not creation. Men did not invent this. Men merely discovered what God had already invented and what God had already brought together through his supernatural power. Okay, so what? <laughs> what does that mean? Well, Jesus said in John eight thirty two. He said, you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Folks, this is really the point of this whole message series. What I'm trying to hammer almost every week is that we have truth on our side as believers. Now, the problem is is that many believers, again, they don't know the truth. They don't get to understand the truth. They don't understand the answers to some of these questions. And therefore, they kind of have this weak need Uh, you know, anemic response with fear and trepidation to these difficult questions that are out there that challenge people in their faith. My admonition to you is to learn more, is to understand more. And when you know the truth, Jesus said, the truth will indeed set you free. So what does that mean for us today? We think about this, okay, the formation of the Bible, all these technical things, what does it mean? Well, first of all, this. Understand that what we have in the Bible was provided by God himself and protected by him throughout time. We say that this is God's word. And it is. It is God's letter to you and me that he processed through centuries that he oversaw and allowed us to now have that which is utterly reliable Secondly, don't just read the Bible. Don't just read the Bible. Allow God to speak to you through it. B.B. Bruce said this. He said, the Bible is written in such a way that when the Bible speaks, God speaks. Do you understand that? Many times we read the Bible in a very passive, very nonchalant way. You know, well, this is kind of nice to have around, and these are little jewels of wisdom, and boy, you know, that's kind of cool. No, it's more than that. This is God's word. And since it's God's word, it is a force to be reckoned with. We don't just read it as we're reading a novel. We just don't read it so we can learn some nice little things to keep around. We read it as God's message to you and me. And because it's God's word, to me, it has authority in my life. And its truth changes me. And when I allow it to challenge maybe my own thoughts and my own conventional wisdom and what the wisdom of the world might say, when I allow it to speak truth to me, it has a transforming power that is unlike any other. And what it says should be heeded. Which leads to the last thing. We should learn it, certainly. We should love it, most definitely. And we should live it. We should live it. See, the real power of this book is not in the knowledge that you will gain from it. The real power of this book is when you apply it and you put it into practice. Remember Jesus' words in Matthew 7, the one who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a man who built his house on the rock. 
the storms came, the winds blew, and the rain beat against that house, but it did not fall. That's the power of God's word. So I want to remind you, I want to remind myself that as we approach God's word, it is God speaking to you and to me. And what it says, I need to do my very best to accept. And even though it defies my own knowledge and sometimes my own experience, uh, defies what I might think is right or wrong, I need to believe it and trust it, and I need to put it to the test. Folks, listen. We come to understand God's will through it. And we don't approach God's will as if just to kind of vote on it and just to consider it. God doesn't reveal his will to us just so we can ponder it. He gives his will to you and me for us to heed it and to respond to it. And with trust and faith and with the gumption to say, you know, I'm going to trust God at his word. Will you do that? Some of you right now, There's a teaching in the scripture. There's something that God has been saying to you, teaching to you. There's something he's been reminding you about, some command, some principle. And beyond a shadow of a doubt, though you might want to doubt its veracity on its face, you know it's true. (laughs) You know it's right. And the struggle that you're having is not an intellectual one. It's a heart issue. It's an issue of trust. Will you trust God at what he says? Will you believe him at his word? Let's pray together. Father, we praise you for the way that in the complexities and in the ups and downs of history and through men who were flawed and fallible, you preserved and you protected and you provided for us your word. Thank you, God. Thank you that in the spirit of understanding how all this came together, that we can have confidence And just as those first and second century Christians recognized and celebrated and with joy, Father, acknowledge the record of Scripture, we can do so today also. 2,000 years, Father, have passed since that time. And yet what we have is what was studied, what was read, what was celebrated and what was transforming the lives of people in the first century. And we are so thankful for that, God. That's only a result of your Holy Spirit and your power. So, Lord, when we read your word, when we study it, when we come to church, when we read it at home, help us to understand it's your words to us. It's authoritative. It's powerful. It should be the um, filter by which we make all of our decisions. It is the means by which we come to trust you. So I pray, Father, that your word would become real in our lives and that we would indeed learn it with all of our might, with all of our mind, that we would love it with all of our heart that we would live it with all that we are. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you. We're going to have our offering time now. If you're a guest, we invite you to place that response card that you filled out in the offering plate as it's passed. Or again, if you want to pick up your guest bag, we invite you to do that after the service. Uh, This is a time for us to worship God uh, through our tithes and offerings. And we're very happy that uh, you were here today. Some of you may have needs. You've come into the room. You've got needs on your heart. You've got things that are going on. You've got people that you're thinking of. And
Maybe you're facing special situations. At the end of every service, if uh, you would be so inclined, we have people who will be right here on the front row who would be happy to pray with you. You've got something on your mind, your heart. You need to give it to God. You want to have somebody pray with you, pray for you. You're more than welcome then after the services to come up here, meet with one of our prayer counselors, and they would be happy to pray with you. God bless you. Have a great week.